Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 194. Life is a tragedy when seen in the close-up, but comedy is in a long shot. Charlie Chaplin. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustler, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by taylorsound.com. One of the most complicated problems I've had in my professional career is sound, and sound mixing, sound design is generally always very expensive. But Taylor Sound has come onto the scene and has done something pretty incredible. Like so many other things you have in the world today, now you can get your sound design online. They're offering flat promotional rates for commercials, music videos, short films, and any other video content that's short form. They're very affordable, and because you are an Indie Film Hustle Tribe member, we'll get 15% off your order. Just type in the word hustle in the post your brief section. That's T-A-I-L-O-R sound.com. One of the hardest things to do in all of filmmaking and of storytelling is to make someone laugh. That is one of the toughest jobs around for any filmmaker or creative. And today's guests, Peter Desberg and Jeffrey Davis, have written a book called, Now That's Funny, The Art and Craft of Writing Comedy, where they interview some of the top comedy writers in all of Hollywood. Saturday Night Live, Everyone Loves Raymond, The Simpsons, Frasier, Home Improvement, Modern Family, Cheers, uh, There's Something About Mary, The Tracy Ullman Show, and and the the list goes on and on. This book was so uh, amazing when I read it in regards to just how the comedy mind works and how everyone's process is so different. And they really get into the details about what is really funny and how do you make people laugh in a story. So I wanted to bring them on the show because we haven't had a lot of comedy. I think we've never had anyone talk strictly about comedy on the show. And it's such a big part of filmmaking because if you could add a little bit of laughter, even in your action movies, the best action movies, um, the best thrillers have a little bit of, of humor in it somewhere along the line, whether it be dark humor like Hitchcock or more the lethal weapon diehard style comedies of the 80s to all of the Marvel movies that are coming out today. Iron Man would not be Iron Man without just the amazing uh, comedy aspects of a great action story. So I wanted to bring Peter and Jeffrey on so they can really break down comedy for us and help us make a few more people laugh in the world because God knows we need some more laughter in the world. So without any further ado, here is my interview with Peter Desberg and Jeffrey Davis. I'd like to welcome to the show Peter Desberg and Jeffrey Davis. Thank you guys for doing the show. Thank you. Our pleasure. So let's get started. How did you guys first meet? And well, first, how did each of you get into the business? And then how did you meet? Uh, how did we? How did I get into the business? Either, yeah, both of you guys. Uh, well, Jeffrey got into the. I love that when I talk to myself <laughs> in the third person. You learn nothing about uh, I, I was born into it. I'm three generations. My uncle was a composer. My dad started at MGM in 1947. A lot of the stuff you see on Turner, stuff he wrote. He went into TV in the early 50s. Ended up producing things like The Odd Couple and That Girl and. Mm-hmm. And forward, and uh, my stepfather was uh, a producer of uh, television felt movies mm-hmm. back in the seventies, eighties, and nineties when um, they were going through that golden age of TV movies. Mm-hmm. And I had a stepmother who was a uh, MGM player and who was um, uh, a, a woman named Marilyn Maxwell. Best movie is Champion with Kirk Douglas, which is an independent film. Mm-hmm. If you've ever seen it. Um, so I kind of grew up around it and I've been around it my whole life. Uh, did go back and I was by coastal before Peter Allen invented the term. So, <laughs> okay. Fantastic. How about you, Peter? Well, for openers, since, uh, since this is a podcast and you have the power to edit, uh, I'm going to answer the first part of your question about how Jeffrey and I met. Okay. Sure. Um, I'm sitting up here in my house one day and Jeffrey is down in his car. Our kids are having a play date. They're eighth graders. Mm -hmm. And he's waiting for his son to come down. 
honking the horn. The kid is not coming down. <laughs> and he's dreading walking in and having another, oh, hi, what do you do? My name is, here's what I do, mm-hmm. conversation. Mm-hmm. So he comes in, we start talking. And one of the things, he tells me he's a writer, but now he's working as an academic. Jeffrey, uh, he's too modest to tell you, is the current uh, chair of the uh, screenwriting department at uh, Loyola Marymount University. Very cool. So he says, uh, but now they're asking me to do academic writing. Um, Do you do any? Well, being that I was a college professor as well, uh, I started laughing, saying that's all I've done forever. (laughs) And as we continue talking, I told him about a a project that I did years and decades ago that I got started with where uh, I was working with a – I'm telling you the long version of the story. If you want, I can edit it down. That's fine. No, it's fine. Go ahead. So I was working with – some woman calls me up one night and said, I heard you do research on the psychology of humor. I'm doing my master's degree in that area. Would you be on my committee? So I said, well, what are you doing? So I get, oh, I'm doing a chapter on the psychology of humor, sociology of humor, anthropology of humor, and I'm interviewing a famous Hollywood comedy writer. Um, I said, who is it? And she gives me a name of the fellow whose name is on the cornerstone of the Writers Guild building. It's first president. (laughs) Okay. This fellow wrote um, a couple of the biggest Bob Hope movies, Lemon Drop Kid. uh, I mean, Lemon Drop Kid. uh, Oh, he wrote for Abbott and Costello. Uh, Abbott and Costello. And so I said, said, how do you know this guy? He said, he's my dad. (laughs) So... (laughs) Um, his name was Edmund Hartman, for people who like to know. Mm-hmm. And and so I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'd be glad to work with you. Let's throw out your three chapters. Could your dad get us some of his friends to interview? And he said, oh, no problem. And so what we did um, for hers is we started asking these people. Instead of just, you know, we wanted to avoid interviews like, well, you know, what got you into comedy? Well, when you're a, a fat Jewish kid on the Lower East Side, you got to learn how to fight or be funny. We didn't want that kind of project. So we constructed a bunch of situations and had them solve problems the comedy writers have to solve. Mm-hmm. So I'm telling Jeffrey this story. And all of a sudden, he said, who are the writers you interviewed? And as I'm telling him each name, his eyes are lighting up bigger and bigger. <laughs> right. And everybody you mentioned used to play poker around my, my crib with my dad every week. He, and he literally jumped off the couch and said, let's do it. Wow. So within about 20 minutes. Yeah, kind of Tom uh, Cruise style, I jumped off the couch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he, being a psychology professor, he yelled at me for that. Yes, of course. <laughs> and, um, and so from, from 20 minutes of just having met, we agreed to write a book together. Um, and we changed the face of it. Um, Notice we're subtly shifting into, uh, now that's funny, the, the book mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. just together, where what we did was we wrote a generic comedy premise, gave it to each of the writers we're working with, and we said, develop it. And surprisingly, they did. What, what we were worried about is when you ask somebody, um, tell us about your creative process, you have no idea if they're telling you anything that's remotely accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, one of, our, one of our favorite phrases is the highest form of fiction is the autobiography. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> so we were really lucky. We got these incredible – we had show creators, uh, showrunners, I mean amazing people, mm-hmm. um, and they did it. We, we got to give them this premise, and right on the spot, they just started making stuff up in the room while we're sitting there. That must have been amazing. Unbelievable. So you guys wrote this book. So you got to wrote this book, Show Me the Funny. And you basically interviewed some of the top and now legendary co- comedy writers in Hollywood. Sorry, but it's called uh, Now That's Funny. Oh, Now That's Funny. Okay. Now That's Funny. Okay. And, uh, and you interviewed these amazing creatives. <laughs> so what was, the, what was the biggest revelation you guys found from interviewing so many amazing uh, and talented people? <laughs> if there's uh, one or two that you can even well there of. is one common denominator and that is we asked them was it story or character that they started yes, with yes that's a great one uh-huh. watch them do it see that's the great thing about the interviews mm-hmm. is 
they're really, in a way, not interviews because we mostly we ask some questions, but we mostly stepped aside and they develop the same premise twenty four ways. And they all neither they didn't say character or or story; they said conflict. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So I thought, for me, that was the biggest revelation. And then also the the diversity of, of stories, the, the, the how different each story is and how many lessons there are in that. It's kind of that's kind of cool, I think. You know, there are so many books on how to write comedy or just how to write scripts. Yes. And each one makes it sound like, well, here are the steps you have to do. Mm-hmm. This is the way you write. And it was so nice to see that exploded in real life where each person is taking a really idiosyncratic view mm-hmm. and we were just fortunate to be in the same room. That must have been insane. So which, well, let me ask you, can you discuss a little bit of, of a few of the comedy genres or some sub genres like, you know, fish out of water or, you know, is there, are there a few of those that you can even discuss for, for the listeners? Um, sure. In the book, you mean that we, yeah. that, that they ended up selecting. Yeah. <laughs> Tell like them the, like the, one. I think that's the best one. Um, yeah. What, one of the, what, what we told them at the beginning was, here's our premise. Mm-hmm. Feel free to change it in any way. You know, our view was, hey, you're comedy writers. You're not gonna, you're not gonna follow rules anyway. It's not like they're accountants. Mm-hmm. They're gonna do what they want. So we said, we'll just start out by stepping out of your way. And the premise that we we did was basically a fifty-ish woman husband passes Mm -hmm. and they've always lived very well. So she assumes that they're going to continue living well. And she didn't know that they spent everything they made. So all of a sudden as an early fifties woman with no skills and no uh, work experience, she's left out in coal with nothing. So she has to move in with her, her young corporate daughter in New York. And one of the, (laughs) one of uh, our favorites was um, this fellow threw out the, uh, the daughter and had the mother get into a work relationship with a man who ends up being a, Ber- a Bernie Madoff character. <laughs> and so all of a sudden she has to expose this horrible thing that he's doing. So, I mean, they went all over the place. And, you know, in a number of cases, um, um, several male writers said, you know, uh, I've actually never been a mother or a daughter, but uh, I sure know a lot about fathers and sons. So that's what I'm going to do. We said, please go for it. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we enjoyed the most was that a lot of them thought out loud for us and they actually narrated while they, they worked the premise. Mm-hmm. Um, one of our favorites was Walt Bennett. And it's a little tough to use the C word now uh, in uh, any public forum, but he wrote for the Cosby show. Yes. And, yes. Uh, Fair enough. <laughs> and Walt was so incredible. He said, okay, um, so let me see. Typically, if somebody says they're coming to visit you, you know when they're coming. So I'm going to have the mother come unannounced because that's going to create more conflict. Mm-hmm. So then he says, OK, so if she's going to come announced, what's the worst time she could possibly select to make her entrance? Well, it's late afternoon. The boyfriend's over at the apartment. They're in their little bedroom. There's a knock on the door. So I said, how can I make this even worse? (laughs) Well, she lived in a big house in the Midwest. And now she's coming to this little efficiency apartment in New York. And normally a person comes to visit with a couple of suitcases. She's got the moving van downstairs. And as she's walking up the stairs, the cousin is lugging up this huge sofa, which will barely fit in the door. And certainly not in the apartment. (laughs) So at each point, he's constantly saying, as Jeffrey was saying, conflict. He's saying, how can I create the conflict and how can I escalate it? How can I make it worse? That's a great, that's a great tip. I mean, because a lot of people will write comedy and not add any conflict. You can't have, I mean, that's the problem with, with comedy, even more than drama, which I think we pretty much all know that comedy is 
harder to write because everybody has an opinion. I mean, there are more agreed upon standards of what makes a drama. Comedy is very much personal taste. And mm -hmm. what you like, I may not like. Or I'm sure we would like the same things. Obviously, well, obviously. Jeff, well, Jeffrey and I have proven that point many times. But the <laughs> other one that I particularly like is Lou Schneider, who was in the room on everybody, writer's room on Everybody Loves Raymond. Uh, there's grandparents in the premise, but they're kind of off to the side, and it really just says uh, it, it, he he took the grandparents. It just says that they don't really understand. They relate more to their granddaughter than their daughter, and he made the whole story between the mother, uh, who's kind of a fish out of water with her parents, mm -hmm. and there, and he had a whole wonderful bit. That I I think it like some of my students have said. Have taught them has taught them a lot about how you can construct character where he has the the 80 year old father teaching the 50 year old mother how to drive which is, <laughs> you know wonderful right. i mean how you you know it's Again, like, he took he took the standard joke of dad teaches his teenage daughter to drive and he switched it to 80 and 50 well right. one of the things that one of the things that i learned mm -hmm. um it is, is that, um, and I've been around, as I said, I've been around it most of my life, but you know, you can help someone get better at comedy. You can give them a lot of techniques, mm -hmm. but I think one of the things we learn from these people is comedy writers are different. They think differently. They think as one of them said, uh, I think Peter Casey said, it's not in the book, but he said, he said to us before the interview, it's a matter of thinking to the left. <laughs> and and okay. uh, now drama writers don't have to do that, and and uh, I'm not putting down drama writers. Yeah, it's just sure. a different gift. But to yeah. give to give you an example, um, we interviewed Elliot Showman, who was the uh, was a showrunner for Home Improvement, mm -hmm. and he told us a great story at the beginning. We said my uh, my father committed suicide, mm -hmm. so I went back east a few years later, got my sister, and. We recreated the drive from his office to the bridge where he jumped. Oh, wow. We're sitting in this cab, and you can't imagine a heavier emotional moment. And I thought, my father was a German Jew and kind of cheap. I wonder how much he tipped the cab driver on the way to his own suicide. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. is a, but that's a, one, I mean, that's a wonderful line. That's such yeah. and, a wonderful But again, it just shows you, as Jeffrey was saying, they, they see things that a lot of people miss. Um, we had a, a, a comedy team, uh, uh, Cinco Paul and Ken Dario. They wrote uh, My Dinner for Schmucks. There are a whole bunch of things. One of the movies they wrote was Bubble Boy. And oh, I remember Bubble Boy. So yeah. they told us a story that they went to a producer with the script, uh -huh. said, I really like the script a lot, but do you think maybe by the first act we can lose the bubble? <laughs> The, the movie's so, called Bubble Boy. <laughs> no, so Ken turned to <laughs> the Zico and he whispered, yeah, we can call it Boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's genius. Um, no, you were talking you – know, you, you were well, saying – go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, just following along with what Jeffrey was saying about conflict, um, one of our favorite interviews, we interviewed Bob Meyer, who, among other things, was the uh, showrunner for Roseanne for a number of years. And tell him who he mentored. Oh, he mentored Chuck Lorre. Um, Chuck who's, this, who's this? Who's this? Who's this Chuck guy you speak of? Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so anyway, he he is such a consummate pro that it took him like you know some people sort of fumbled around to get started. He he said to us, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take these characters and I'm going to cast them so I can see the actors I'm writing for. Okay, and. Mm -hmm. It took him maybe five or six minutes, and he wrote a perfect little sitcom, like a network sitcom version. It was unbelievable to see how quickly and fluidly he wrote. Mm -hmm. So Jeffrey looks at him and says, could you darken it a little? And I, I wish that I could transmit the look he got on his face, the sort of impish grin. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> picture somebody with their hand on a dial saying, how dark do you want it? Mm -hmm. And... So within a couple of minutes, he says, OK, I'm going to kind of lose the mother and I'm going to take this uh, this young corporate girl and I'm going to change her occupation. She's going to be a private detective. 
because that constantly puts her in danger, which will keep a lot of conflict going. And she's very pretty and audiences like pretty people. Mm-hmm. But I got to give her a problem. So I'm going to give her a pretty serious drug habit because that makes her an underdog and we like underdog. We're, st- we're still comedy, right? Still comedy. Got it. And so she's got the big case that she's solving. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And she finally has the opportunity to break the case. She's got a secret witness who's going to reveal everything. Mm -hmm. So she's got this meeting set up and she's on pins and needles waiting to go to this meeting. And to calm herself down, says, I'm going to stop home and change, which means do some drugs. Mm -hmm. And the minute she opens the door, there's everybody she knows ready to do an intervention. Oh, Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) And, and literally, and I mean, he was making this up in the room as we were talking to him. And as soon as he finished, he said, you know what? I'm going to pitch this story. (laughs) No, I was about to say, why aren't these guys pitching these stories? These are brilliant. Several people told us they pitched the ideas that they came up with. We told them everything they come up with is theirs. We just have the right to reprint it. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> now, you talk a lot about, uh, you know, we're talking a little bit about uh, structure and comedy. Is there is there such a, a thing as like a, a comedic hero's journey? Uh, if we're going to uh, – some sort of structure in regards to just writing either television uh, or feature films? Um, I, I, I'm not aware of one. Uh, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there are people who try to sell that hero's journey thing i'm not a big fan of, i'm sorry i'm not a big fan of the hero's journey mm-hmm. uh i i understand there's valuable things in it mm-hmm. my my problem is what's happened and i think we're kind of leaving this period there was a period in the early 2000s late 90s where there were all the gurus you know mm-hmm. uh, i'm not mention any of their names we mm-hmm. all know who they are mm-hmm. where it became almost estian you know uh mm-hmm. where you had to follow you know I went to one, uh, I remember a producer sent me to one. I was working on something. I'm not going to mention the person's name who I went to. And I think the producer must have paid $1,000 for my then partner and I to go. And, and he, got to, he got to a point in it where he said, well, now he had, a, he had like a bunch of steps. And he said, you know, uh, he said, when you go to the studio, don't mention my steps. <laughs> <'Cause they don't, laughs> you know, mm-hmm. And I remember calling up my father, uh, who I went to, for, you know, for advice because he was a great comedy writer. And mm-hmm. he said, call the producer right now and get your money back, get his money back. <laughs> so, yeah, it's comedy. No, I mean, I think pretty much, particularly with this generation, mm-hmm. I think, you know, they have seen so many movies, have read mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. much television. Uh, I think they're starting to read again. Hopefully. You know, they have they have an innate sense of structure. The problem I have is when teachers put structure ahead of character and conflict. Char- character and conflict is where structure comes from, not the other way around. And so often it's easy to teach stru- – well, you know, it is easy to teach structure. Yeah, it's, it's ABCs, different- right. What difference does it make what happens on page 15 if you don't know who the characters are? Now, I, I don't want to be divisive here, mm-hmm. but I think we have to divide your question into two parts. Okay. Uh, so I'm hoping you'll tell me what they are. Okay. The, the two parts <laughs> of my, my question? <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was just messing with you. Um, when you talk about comedy and writing comedy – you have to distinguish a bit between writing for TV and movies. Mm -hmm. And your question really pertained to writing film comedy Mm -hmm. where um, you have a, a story with an arc Mm -hmm. and with it's the opposite in writing like sitcoms because although you have arclets for every episode, the characters have to kind of remain the same because you're counting on those characters being there next week with their same characteristics. And so the arcs of the stories are very different and they're much smaller because everything has to kind of remain the same. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously writing for films and writing for TV is two completely different worlds. Um, 
<clears throat> and because you have a, a course of a season to kind of do arcs, but even writing comedies, I don't, it's not like Breaking Bad, you know, which I could argue is a comedy, but, uh, <laughs> um, but, but dark there are, comedy. it's a dark, it's dark. Yes. But there's, well, no- yeah, yeah, I could, I agree with that. But, uh, I would also point out that comedy off network comedy is more and more serialized. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, a lot of, Feature writers are writing for television now. And I remember as a kid hearing my parents talk about, uh, oh, gosh, we'll never get so-and-so because they only do movies. They don't want to do television. And that is all flipped now. Oh, it's completely. Everybody wants to do television now. No, what uh, do you, so what do you guys think of this whole new streaming revolution that we have going on with the, with the Netflix and the Hulus? And, and I all- think it's wonderful. I think it's great. And I'll tell you why I think it's great. More work. Less money when you're starting. I have two students mm-hmm. who graduated two years ago and are on the reboot, of, very successful, the reboot of One Day at a Time, which oh, wow. is a Hispanic. Um, Rena Moreno's in it. A lot of, you know, um, an, an actress who was on Six Feet Under for the whole run is the star of it. Rena mm-hmm. Moreno's in it. Um, and these two young writers are the junior writers on the show. And yes, they're making a lot less money than they would make on this is us or other network shows, Mm -hmm. but they're getting a break, which would have been much harder to get before. Right. So they're learning their craft from the two showrunners. One is a graduate of LMU many years ago, worked on how I met your mother and a billion other shows. And she, and and her co-creator it was on uh, Everybody Loves Raymond, and Norman Lear comes in every day at 93 years old. Jeez. And, yeah, he's amazing. He is amazing. And uh, so, yeah, it's a wonderful, it's a really good reboot. I mean, uh, I could say some not so great things about some other reboots. <laughs> I think it's I think it's great uh, because I think we have more. Pro- it's basically now who's not making pro- product. Right. There's so much product going on, but it's it's so insane. Yeah. I think so, last count was like 500 shows. Wow. On, yeah. on 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 scripted shows on television right now, or on you can't even say television anymore, but on Jeff, it, Jeffrey's comedy history, mm-hmm. you know, it was back to really really tightly controlled um, sitcoms. I'm mm-hmm. telling six jokes per page. Three, but six two if you like six. You told me it was six. Oh, I, I lied. And I quoted it. <laughs> well, they used to make you put jokes in that had nothing to do with the story. Mm-hmm. There was a joke, a joke per page count. Really? So it's that structure. That's really an old school thing. You know, shows like Taxi and Cheers and and Frasier broke that, you know. And also the Mary Tyler Moore show broke that. Cause mm-hmm. Those were what, you know – Right, writers say those were really be- those were beautifully written shows. Dick Van Dyke oh. show broke that. When uh, when we interviewed Peter Casey and he talked about Frasier, mm-hmm. he said we'd be in the writers' room and somebody would come up with a brilliant joke, and then somebody else would say, "You know what? Um, only ten percent of our audience is going to understand that." And Peter Casey said, "That's why we're keeping it in. We're keeping our ten percenters." <laughs> and it's one of the things that made that show so brilliant. You're right, because there are a lot of jokes that go over you know, people's heads in that show. I remember that show. Even when I was younger watching it, I, I would laugh, but I like some things I just wouldn't get. And then as I watch it as an adult, I'm like, oh, I get that now. Um, yeah. <laughs> but again, once it, it went to cable and beyond, it's you know, everything is, is unshackled now, and you can do pretty much what you want. Yeah, I was going to ask you, do, you, do you feel like because of these new opportunities for writers, they're, they're really – there are the shackles are off. I mean, the creative freedom on some of these shows, these Netflix shows and Hulu shows, Amazon yeah. shows, there there's nothing that would ever go on network television. Well, um, well I mean, if you go yeah. back to the days where you know if the hero is going to kiss the heroine, one foot had to be on the floor, right? <laughs> right. Um, also, so, the, the yeah, I'm sorry, Peter. Go ahead. Please, the Netflix model is very different. They they don't uh, interfere in the same way that the networks do. Uh, and you know, they'll give you notes, but from what I understand from the people I know who are working with Netflix, that they just love it. I don't know anything about Hulu. I don't know. I don't know. I, I know they, they did a wonderful, they took the, this is not comedy, but they took the Margaret Atwood book mm-hmm. 
know, and they're doing that. And she was so happy with it. She's letting them do a second season, which is, was, is not the novel. So, so Handmaid's Tale. Yes. So I think, you know, is there always going to be crap? Yes. Yes. <laughs> always going to be crap. But yes. it's much fewer crap now. Yeah. I, I, I think the one thing that, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, the networks will go away. I do not believe they, first of all, the networks own a big chunk of basic cable. So mm -hmm. they must have something. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, the big hit on the networks right now is this show uh, called This Is Us, which is created by a comedy writer mm -hmm. and it's sort of melodrama, has comedy and drama in it, mm -hmm. uh, which is not the definition of melodrama, but mm -hmm. has that. And I, I know somebody who is running the Jennifer Lopez show, which is a detective show. Mm -hmm. And this is the networks. What they do, as opposed to, to Netflix and Hulu, is they gave this guy who's a very successful guy, they gave him the note make it make the scenes more like this is us which is a family show and he's writing a cop show oh jesus <laughs> which is which, so that still goes on at the networks i think um the networks did smarten up a couple of years ago they put they went back to summer replacement mm -hmm. they realized they had to when i was a kid you know, um, the, uh, I forget, uh, someone would go off and the Smothers Brothers would come on or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there would be summer shows. Now we're back to that on the networks. They have to to keep the ratings up. But it's interesting that almost every writer that uh, that we interviewed managed to say something bad about who they had to write for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, right. And, a number of them said, you know what? I've made enough money as a writer now. I'm becoming a playwright because nobody can touch a single word of my script unless I permit it. Right. And they were just so sick of the idea that somebody's always taking this stuff and rewriting them or reinterpreting them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, do you, have you guys seen that show, Grace and Frankie, the Jane Fonda? It's great. It's, ama it's, it's amazing. When I saw that show come up, and obviously, it's not aimed at my demographic. I'm a younger guy, um, but I've had I've had millennials. I have, I know millennials who are huge fans of that show. Well, they were very smart in the way they wrote it. Is that they had uh, they had uh, um, a younger demographic because of you know they don't pay attention to demographics anyway at that sure. point. It's all who's watching sure. and what are they watching. Mm -hmm. So I guess it is a form of demographic. It's not the network. It's not the Nielsen's. No, no, it's, it's changed but a bunch. There's a younger generation in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, all I can say is um, there are so many shows on television that owe a huge debt to Neil Simon and the odd couple. Oh, because God. Man. If Grace and Frankie is not the odd couple, God, you know who created that show is uh, Grace and Frankie is – Marty Kaufman, who created co-created Friends, mm -hmm. so you can sort of see it's a deep version of Friends. Yeah, I mean, and, but you know, the the point with Grace and Frankie is like that show would never, I don't think, ever hit network television. It, it, oh no, no. Uh, well, it would have during the time of the Golden Girls. I mean, if yes. nobody wanted to make the Golden Girls and look at that. You know, that's. Have, that's, have you heard? How, have you heard that there is a monster rev, like? resurgence in the golden girls like the, the fan base is all these millennials it doesn't are, surprise me at all it's a great show i was watching it when i was a teenager yeah. i was in love with that show it was just such a wonderful show it was so well written the characters were so well developed and susan harris is an amazing writer i mean it was wonderful and you and you and then you go back and you go my god how was a teenager watching the golden girls like how is that but it's amazing. But because when because again, they made sure that the stories were universal. Yep. And the networks didn't want to make a show about older women past fifty. Mm -hmm. You know, when Estelle Getty was doing that, I don't know if you know this. When Estelle Getty was playing B. Arthur's mother, she was actually younger than B. Arthur. <laughs> really? I had no idea. Well, that was good makeup on her part then. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the the, the great thing is. Now That's Funny has all of these stories in it, too, mm -hmm. about, about show business and about uh, uh, the history of show business. Peter, tell the uh, – One of the interesting yeah. things is that 
everybody practically that we interviewed said, you know, we're t we find that we're telling you stories that we don't normally tell in interviews because of the difference in format that we've done. Mm -hmm. And all of these things came up in really interesting ways. Um, one, of, one of my favorite stories, uh, you mentioned before you were a fan of Frasier. Mm -hmm. we, asked, uh, we asked Peter Casey about, about the chair. <laughs> yeah. House, and he said, we treated that chair like a character. Mm -hmm. Frasier was a spinoff character from Cheers. Mm-hmm. And he was getting a chance to build a new life. He was now going to be a minor celebrity in a secondary market. He had a building in the, the coolest part of Seattle. He hired one of the best decorators and every style and curve of furniture and color matched and was coordinated. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, at the last minute, his dad moves in. <laughs> and that chair was the reminder that you're never going to have the life you planned. It, it actually showed you a concrete version of the conflict. He said, we brought in our set designer to find the ugliest fabric that he could find. <laughs> then he brought in a swatch book of the, every color that you could have of that horrible pattern. Mm -hmm. They picked the most clashing color. And then they brought it in. They, they created the chair. And then they, they took a uh, utility knife and slashed it. And then put in duct tape all over it. Oh, jeez! And, and there it was in every show. You said, "See, <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant." Now, now, what are some of the common mistakes you find writers uh, making when they're writing comedy? Um, go ahead. You're on a roll. Mm, oh. Yeah, no. <laughs> I think common mistakes. I could. Whew, I mean. Okay, I, I can give you one usually is that you create a joke that's too esoteric because a joke is based on shattering an assumption mm -hmm. and people don't know enough to make that assumption. It's not going to be funny. If I make a joke about a, uh, a postal delivery guy, well, we have a whole bunch of reactions we have to the post office and that's going to work. Mm -hmm. If I give you a joke about a pastry chef and how he used the wrong kind of shortening. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not so much. Only the pastry chefs in the audience will get it. Exactly. And so that's one thing you're always going to do. Mm -hmm. Another is there's a level of tension you have to get in order to get a laugh. Too little and you don't get it too much and you gross out the audience. So it's, it's another place where, where terrible things happen. Okay, those, so so movies like There's Something About Mary, which arguably is a is a classic. Well, um, we interviewed Ed, Ed Dechter, who, who wrote, wrote it, that movie. Wrote it, yeah. Right, and that movie at the time, I mean, and for the audience, for members in the audience who weren't around or didn't understand that time, when that movie hit, it was a gigantic hit. Oh, uh, yeah. And so they – uh, 11 it, years to get made. Did you know that? that I did not know that, but I'm, it doesn't surprise me at least because that it, movie it, is. It was a great story that, that Ed told us that he took it around, couldn't get it made, bumped into one of the Farrelly brothers mm -hmm. who said, how did that movie your viewers do? He said it never got made. He said, you're kidding. When I give talks to students, I use that script as an example. We got to make that movie. And they were hot, hotter than hot at that moment in time. Uh, exactly. And they got it made. I think within months. So, <laughs> That's but, you know, again, you could see, you know, we just talked, for example, about uh, how much tension do you put in there? Mm -hmm. The fact that you're making jokes about a person who has an intellectual deficit oh, is God. a really touchy subject for oh, a lot of people. That whole movie was a touchy subject. <laughs> yeah. that, that scene where, oh. Um, the hair, uh, the hair scene. <laughs> yeah, you've got, <laughs> yeah, can I borrow some of that moose? Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. in, in, normally they teach you not to kick the dog, but they do more than that in this movie to that point. Well, but but the, the trick was uh, that, and, and John talked a little bit, John and, uh, and, and um, John Strauss wrote that with um, Ed Dechter. Mm -hmm. so, and they had the script out there forever. But what Ed talked about was the fact that you liked these people so much mm -hmm. that you you liked everybody in the movie except maybe uh, Matt uh, Dillon. 
Matt Dillon. <laughs> but they, even, even Matt Dillon was such a, a nerd. No, but they used such yeah. a great device. When when we uh, when, when we interviewed Charlie Peters, mm-hmm. he told us that um, one of the things he loves to use is a device called a third object. Okay. He gave us an example of Beauty and the Beast, where at one point they're having this this lavish dinner outside, and they see a wolf, and the beauty's her heart is pounding and she's frightened, mm-hmm. and the beast is salivating, looking at dinner. Mm-hmm. And it showed you immediately there's their separate reactions to the same object, and you immediately saw their character differentiation. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And so, um, in there's something about Mary, the the uh, the intellectual deficit boy acted as a third object mm-hmm. where one character was really empathic and went out of his way to be nice to him. And the other character, you know, it kind of kicked him and then pushed him around when nobody was looking. So you saw their personalities by the same way they treated the third object in this case, that, that boy. I was just, as, as you were talking about that, I just, the thing Frank and beans just came into my head. And Frank and Beans, Frank and Beans, such a great movie. Yeah, Frank and Beans, that's a, my favorite scene, of course. Cause, <laughs> cause, because, uh, and then the other thing that this is about these stories you learn is that is is that um, one of the Farrell, I think Peter Farrelly said, we're gonna we're gonna do this, Ben with you playing yourself at 17 and he said no one will ever buy that and of course we look at the movie now and we say it wouldn't work without that so it's funny how these decisions get made in comedy and and there's a lot of stories like that in 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 the book now i i've i've been around uh, and been working with stand-up comics probably for a better part of a decade uh and i i've I've been around uh, these sad clowns uh, for a long time. Uh, some of them are my best. Some of them are my best friends. And just uh, from your point of view, because I'm sure a lot of the, the people you interviewed or you talked to do some sort of stand-up comedy in one way, shape, or form. Uh, do comics, in your opinion, need therapy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't answer that because um, I'm a I, I'm a I'm a client uh, or right. a patient. As, as somebody who has done that very thing. Okay. First, going back, one of the – we found two interesting things. Uh, one is that a number of the people that we wrote had graduate degrees in math and science. Hmm. And what's interesting is in when you're in a writer's room, they kind of break down into two groups. They're either story guys or joke guys. And all the ones with math and science backgrounds were story guys. Mm-hmm. And a, I don't know, probably a third to a half of the uh, the writers we interviewed had stand-up experience. And obviously, they were the joke guys. Mm-hmm. And it's a very different approach that they took. And you, know, you may find this interesting that we uh, – one of the questions we asked after all this was done was, how do you know if your stuff is funny? And, you know, I remember back to a, a guy I interviewed decades ago who said, you know, that's a really tough thing for me as a writer because I sit in my office by myself working on a movie and I come up with what I think is a good joke. So I walk out to my secretary of 14 years and say, do you think this is funny? And she says, yeah, that's real funny. <laughs> and he says, with stand-ups, it's a survival skill. You tell, you tell the bit, you've got a half second to find out if it worked or not. And you learn to survive by getting that instinct of, is this going to work? And interestingly, we had four or five teams of writers. Mm-hmm. And they said, we find out instantly if something's funny if we make our partner crack up. That makes – yeah, that makes perfect sense. They're, they're their own bouncing boards. Yeah, and they're always trying to, to make the other guy laugh. And, um, it's, and, they're, hard, and they're probably harder to make laugh than anybody else. Because they know each other's techniques. That's right. It's, That's right. it's interesting that um, I worked with a, a friend of mine uh, named Greg Dean. I don't know if you've run across him, who's a stand up coach in Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. We wrote a piece of software teaching people how to write jokes. Okay. And one of the things we talk about is that basically stand ups rant. That's what they do. They talk about stuff that frustrates them, that gets them angry, that. Uh, mm-hmm. And so again, 
you have to find material that other people are also going to find kind of annoying and then find a take on what you do. And so, again, we get this idea that, that stand-ups are either angry people or they're, uh, you know, a lot of people like, uh, you know, Louis C.K., one of our favorites, mm-hmm. talks about personally painful stories but makes them funny. Yes, he does. Impression <laughs> that all these people are depressed. But um, tell him the Lewis Black story. But, um, oh, I love Lewis. I me too. Uh, he was, you know, his 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 persona is he's a very very angry guy. Mm-hmm. And I heard a couple of years ago, I some idiot journalist was, you know, who obviously hadn't prepared was asking him a question. It was one of those events and there were, he was probably getting interviewed like 20 times in this one red carpet event. And they said, so are you this angry off stage as you are on stage? And he said, uh, I hope this is the story Peter's thinking of. Yes. I'll be in big trouble later. It is. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he said, no, obviously not. If I were, I would have had a stroke by now. You know, <laughs> with all the things there are to be angry about. No, he said it's his persona. And he talked about, he actually talked in that same interview about Jack Benny, who I worship mm-hmm. and, and who was actually in real life an incredibly generous person worked to um, with Rubenstein, I think to, to save Carnegie hall was incredibly generous human being helped so many people, but that's not funny. Cheap is funny. Generous Mm -hmm. is not, you know, so that's what Louis Louis block was saying. And, and also, I don't know if you knew Louis block started as a playwright. That makes so he, sense. He's he's he's, he's so he's, sharp. Yeah, he went to he went to Yale Drama. And he has a master's degree in drama. Wow. Yeah, he went to Yale. <laughs> no, that's I, I, playwright. That's the school. No, I, I, after being around stand-up comics for so long, you 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 see their stage persona, and then the guys off stage are not generally that. Very yeah. rarely do I see one that's on all the time, and if they are on all the time, they're going to burn out sooner rather than later uh, i was thinking about one because he died the other day jerry lewis oh who, god yeah uh who was on all the time and needed to be the center of attention and i'm sure that it came from an enormous insecurity in his childhood or something i mm-hmm. mean don't have to be a psychologist to figure that out um but uh yeah, I was much sadder about Don Rickles because Don Rickles oh, Don. in real life was a great guy. I heard that from people that he was – he's just a very sweet man. He was a great guy. He was a sweet man. He was not nearly as uh, – um, uh, not what's the word I'm looking for? Um, he what rough. Persona, but if you really look at my, – I took my son six months before he died. I took my son to see Rickles. Mm-hmm. That's and, genius. Uh, and uh, he was still – his, he, in a wheelchair, but his mind was clear and he was really funny. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and 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 the thing is, is that if you really look at it from our perspective of 2017, it wasn't all that mean, you know. And it wasn't. You're it right. Wasn't, you know, um, the one thing I want to just go back for a second. One of the things that we did in the book is we asked a lot about process. Okay. And one of the things that I've noticed is that. What most people say, I don't know if this always got into the news because we did a lot of editing. We the book would have been the the Bible if we had everything <laughs> in, you know. Right. Is once you start writing, don't go back. Keep writing, you know, on the first draft. If there are places missing, keep going. Um, a lot of people liked outlines, but just as many didn't. Mm-hmm. Now in television, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this might be of interest is People don't outline first in comedy. You sit in a room, and this is what I thought that the the great thing about um, now that's funny is that is is that you actually are going into a writer's room. And the thing Peter talked about uh, that Bob Meyer did is exactly what goes on in a writer's room. You you just keep pitching ideas and stories, and and then you come up with something. And, you know, you'll be in there 12, 13 hours in, 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 in the real world. But one of the things they've all said is, yes, you can outline, but 
in TV, you break a story in a room. I know they did that even on Breaking Bad. You sit with the other writers mm -hmm. and you break the story. Then someone goes out and writes the outline. And then I know she's Mad Men, which had comedic elements. All of the scripts were written. The scripts were written in the room with all the writers together, which I've never heard of before. But it worked. And guess what? All the writers except one on Mad Men had been sitcom writers, including Matt Weiner or Weiner, I don't know how he pronounces it, mm -hmm. who was on Golden Girls. That was his big break. The guy that created Mad Men was a sitcom writer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Did you know that Alan Ball started as a sitcom writer? That I make, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, he was on Civil. Well, okay. he's a playwright like Sorkin, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, the the big advice I've gotten over the years, and that's in the book, is once you start, don't stop. Keep going till you get a a crappy first draft, and uh, you know because otherwise you'll be on it forever. I I have a colleague who who keeps talking to me about a, a screenplay he's been writing for 20 years. And I'm thinking, well, maybe if you're writing a novel, you might take 10 years. A mm. screenplay? No. <laughs> no, I, I've, I've talked to numerous screenwriters on this show. And uh, yeah, the professional, they're all obviously professional screenwriters. So when you, when I tell them stories of, you know, Oh, I've had this guy who's been on a screenplay for three years. They're like, that's, they're not professionals. The, right. the professionals don't do that. No one's there's no there's no honor in the struggling writer who took five years to write the movie. That there's just there's right. that's ridiculous. I uh, think if you're writing a novel, that's take different. As long as you need, that's really a different form. That's a different form. But as far as screenwriting uh, yeah. or, or or sitcom writing or anything like that, you don't take that long to do it. Professionals knock it out. Uh, and the best advice. And the, and, yeah. And I think the, the thing you're saying is, and I completely agree with it is they have to learn to manage the, the feeling that it sucks. They have to deal yes. with that. And that professional does a professional. Now, to give, to give a little empirical support to what Jeffrey's saying. Uh, what's it, the word empirical mean? I don't think either of us. <laughs> that is a, that's a 52 cent word, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'd like to say I'm bucking the trend, but you'll say that's a hundred cent word. <laughs> it's a phrase, sir. That's a phrase. So you, so you were saying? <laughs> yes. Before I was what? Um, <laughs> there was a huge study on creativity at Berkeley, mm -hmm. and they found two traits that cut across every field um, in terms of creativity. The creative people, A, have the ability to tolerate ambiguity. And B, the important one, they've learned not to judge. They avoid judging. They suspend it. And mm -hmm. what you know, Jeffrey's always telling me, his students will write a draft or two and they say, oh, this is no good. And they don't want to go on because they haven't created a masterpiece in their first draft. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we, like, uh, we like Hemingway's phrase of uh, write drunk, edit sober. That's a that's a great way. <laughs> that's a great um, great saying, and it's so true. Is it? Is it I, I know Mamet said it, but I think he took it from Hemingway. What, writing is easy. All you have to do is sit in front of the typewriter and bleed. Yeah, yeah. Watch the blood spots appear on your forehead. Yeah, I'm not sure who said it, but I know yeah. Mamet said it. But I think he took it from yeah, Hemingway. No, you're right. It was Hemingway. You're it was right. it was Hemingway. Yeah. No, the best advice I ever got for screenwriting or writing in general was from, uh, and I say this story all the time on the show, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, Jim Ools, the writer of Fight Club. Sure. Mm -hmm. he, he, he said, if you're going to begin writing, sit down, write a screenplay. Do not stop. Go all the way through. Do not edit. Just write it out. When you're done, put it in a drawer. Sit down, start writing the second screenplay. And then do the same thing, and then start writing the third screenplay. When you're done with the third screenplay, pick up the first screenplay, and then start rewriting that. Because by now, you're a better writer than you were when you first started. That's um, great advice. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. Uh, um, we had uh, Pedro Almodovar mm -hmm. came to uh, the university last year. and I love his process. Oh, he's he, amazing. He will write 
three things at once, and he'll have different desks, which I think Freud was the one who started that. He only has so, two. So he'll he'll have different desks. So if he gets blocked on one project, he'll go to the other. He doesn't stop and. And uh, I I think that's kind of what you're what you're saying is is if 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 you get frozen on something rather than suffering over it go to another project and the problem will probably be solved when you come back. I always recommend even though it's not a a, um, a screenwriting book I I I always think the Anne Lamott book Bird by Bird any writer should read that before before you go past this point yeah. um, an old comedy writer that I interviewed. And this was before the days of computers when he was writing on typewriter. said, whenever I find myself blocked, what I do is I go back and I take the last two pages I wrote and I tear them up. Oh, God. I don't care how clever it was. It got me into this corner. Yeah. That, I, that's a, that's, so you purposely delete what you just wrote in yeah, order to get you to start writing again. Yeah, and you may not realize that you boxed yourself in, but you did. No, of yeah. course. Of course. That's ooh, that's that's brutal, that's, but yet very effective. Yeah, that's a good tip, Peter. I don't think you've ever shared that with me. Before. I have, but you don't pay attention when we talk. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I could bring you two together a little way in this well, wait, episode. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> It'll be gone by lunch. <laughs> All right. So I have a few more questions to ask you. Sure, um, what advice would you give a writer wanting to break into writing for television in today's world? Um, well, my advice is going to be coming from my now 14 years at Loyola mm -hmm. and nine years. Oh, good God. It's coming up on nine years as chair of screenwriting. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm not talking about the grad students. Now I'm talking about undergrads. Mm -hmm. who are very young. We'll come out at, you know, but anywhere between 22 and 24, mm -hmm. you take any job you can get. Some of them come out and they say, well, I want to be a writer's assistant in the writer's room because I want to write. Well, you got to earn that. That doesn't. It was very. What, what the story I told you about my two students who are on, who are on uh, one day at a time now. Mm -hmm. They had one of them was Jeff Garland's uh, assistant for a year and a half, almost mm -hmm. two years, um, and then worked on uh, the TV show he's on now. And the other one made independent films and uh, shorts and did temp jobs. And then this producer, a creator who had been their teacher at school, brought them together as a team and brought them on the show. But you take any job you can get as long as it's in the business. Let All me, of my me, seniors from last year are working. That's now awesome. Let, me, let yeah. me just add something to what Jeffrey said by using the N-word, mm -hmm. uh, networking. <laughs> the number of job, you know, the number of people that get into a room because a friend of our, you know, friend of his said, "Hey, there's a vacancy in the room. Come on in." Mm -hmm. Numbers the people that get in because they're so wonderful, and so you know, meet as many people as you can, work with as many people as you can, um, and be pleasant while you're doing it. Yeah, I, I think the days when you could be a a spoiled entitled person I, I, are over. I'll tell you, um, J.J. Abrams, who's, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, but J.J.'s, like, we're best buddies. J.J. Mm -hmm. Abrams' dad was a big producer. Mm -hmm. So J.J. is not first generation. His dad was a TV movie producer. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was raised inside the business. And he, he says that the minute someone who comes to work for he and his wife mm -hmm looks entitled they're out they mm -hmm. don't give them a second chance because there's too many people who want that chance mm -hmm. i couldn't be spoiled and entitled and difficult um i'm very proud of the students at lmu because they don't come out with that entitled attitude they are willing to start at the bottom and pay their dues the odds of i mean aside from what happened to the two students i mentioned that's mostly going to happen to grad students and even then it's going to take a couple of years you have to be prepared if you want to be a writer in television i can't speak to movies because movies are an entirely different business now mm -hmm. And and the majors don't make that many movies. Right. But in television, you have to be prepared to give it a minimum of five years so you're where you think you want to be. You know, as yeah. a, I you know I moonlight as a clinical psychologist, and I only work with people who have stage fright. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember one actor coming in to see me and his first words are, I'm an actor. I don't do uh, commercials and I don't do soaps. First Good luck. Of mouth. Good luck. And I said, oh, and you forgot. And I don't work. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, say that or, you know. I no, did. Oh, I did. Yeah. It's, well, it, it, yeah. No, no, no. It's uh, the, that that kind of mentality is the I don't want to do this or I don't want to do that is that the worry the business will beat them out of that eventually. You know, because you know, you're someone who never says that. Mm-hmm. That's why everybody loves her except Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Meryl Streep does not even today have that attitude. And she certainly could if she wanted to. Her attitude is she doesn't want to do something. Is She's very gentle. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And she's very loving. And she sometimes will even recommend someone she thinks is more right for something. But that's why she's Meryl Streep. It's not just because she's a brilliant actress. Um, you know, there is never a reason to be unkind to other people that you work with. And you will be remembered for that. Other than Peter being unkind to me on a daily basis, Mm -hmm. which I've gotten used to. If you Uh, have three or four hours, I can give you a couple of really good stories. (laughs) Why he's unkind to me? Exactly. Yeah. Um, We'll do part two. (laughs) We barely scratch the surface. I think think it's a really important thing for young writers to remember. Mm Mm-hmm. Is you've got to earn it. You've got to earn it. And even when you get into the room, if oh. you get into the room too soon. Oh, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, how can I not make myself the hero of this story? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I had a student. Listen, because so, this is a first. <laughs> the best undergraduate joke writer mm-hmm. from character uh, that I've ever had in the 14 years of being there. Uh, she was 21. I mean, this is how good she was. She could look at somebody else's cause I run my, I run my classes like a writer's room, mm-hmm. particularly the upper division class. And cause that's how I was taught. And, and she could look at somebody else's script and come up with like eight jokes that fit the characters. She had studied their script so much, knew their script so well, and that's what you want in a writer's room. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get in a writer's room right after I graduate. And I said, Diona, I don't think that's going to happen. And if it did, I think it would be a really bad thing for you. Mm -hmm. You'll be 22. You'll be looked at as the baby writer and baby writers are usually between 25 and 30. Mm -hmm. And you'll be, you will be out of the business by the time you're 25. What about grad school? And so she, on her own, looked up some grad programs, and they had just started the Harold Ramis Second City Master's mm-hmm. Program. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's where she is now. She's finishing up. I told you, it didn't work. I'm still the hero of the story. <laughs> <laughs> but giving her that, that, giving her that extra time – with her in April when she was in town because uh-huh. it's in Chicago the program and I, they you know they were trying to honor Harold Ramis mm-hmm. and by naming it after him and she's a different person she's calm she's loving school mm-hmm. which I don't think she loved being an undergrad mm-hmm. well look yeah. at the instructor she had I mean seriously yeah. and of course she <laughs> is an instructor so <laughs> By giving that little extra time for nurturing and just time yeah. to kind of develop a little bit, even as talented as she might have been, it's right. kind of like it's kind of like throwing Michael Jordan in or LeBron James into playing basketball when they're fifteen. They're really talented, but just give it a couple of years. You know, I told you a story before about Walt Bennett. He told us a story that when he was a new guy in a room, he he pitched a joke, mm-hmm. and it was like the wind was blowing. Nobody heard anything. Mm-hmm. 20 minutes later, one of the more seasoned writers told the same joke, just pitched the same joke and everybody cracked up. Mm-hmm. And Walt said, wait a minute, I just pitched that joke. And they looked at him and said, come on, don't be like that. <laughs> wow. And, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, um, Jeffrey talked about Lou Schneider before, who told a great story that they were in the room and the writer next to him grabs him and pulls him down below the table 
and says, pitch this joke for me. Mm-hmm. He says, why don't you pitch it yourself? He said, you did stand-up. You'll pitch it better. Wow. <laughs> the nice thing about Lou is he gave her credit. That's nice of her. That's that's rare in this this business. Yeah. Canadians are not known. And it only took him four months to get around to it. We we interviewed someone that we have not yet found the book for, but a, a, a stand-up named Carrie Snow, who's an old friend of mine. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, one night she was uh, she got a, one afternoon she got a, a letter with a check for five hundred dollars in it from Robin Williams, and he said, "I was doing stand-up." This is maybe like 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I inadvertently used one of your jokes, so I felt I had to pay for it. Wow. Yeah, he was such a sweet guy. Uh, He was. I had had the pleasure of meeting him once, and he's – the the thing with Robin when I met him is that I have never met another human being whose energy – you could literally feel the vibration off of him. And he wasn't on. He was – calm he was with his wife you know as as calm as can be he was not cracking jokes he was just a normal human being but you can sense that energy off of him and i've never met another human being like that uh, you know his mentor was like that because i i grew up around jonathan winters i knew him pretty well i heard i heard about that with jonathan yeah, well. he was close friends with uh he was close friends with my stepfather and i i um and I, I hope you weren't planning to use that piece of paper. Wow. Oh, well, then you should never put blank paper in front of me. I'm going to write. You're going to have to do some editing here, my friend. It's fine. Uh, we, we just let it go. <laughs> so did you have some? Uh, yes, I have, to, I have two more questions I wanted to ask you guys. Um, sure. What is the lesson that took you guys the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, <laughs> that's an easy one. Mm-hmm. You can give yours first, and then I'll steal it. (laughs) (laughs) I'll give you an answer, and Jeffrey will say, me too. Mm -hmm. As far as life lessons are concerned. Mm -hmm. He hasn't learned any yet. It's very fun. (laughs) Since I'm still a student, Mm -hmm. that's that's a really tough one. Um, Boy, I'm good at answering narrower questions. Uh But, you know, the other day I did a podcast, and somebody said, and this was a, a screenwriter, and she said, what's your favorite sitcom and your favorite uh, comedy movie of all time? Mm-hmm. And I looked at her and I said, tell me your favorite movie. And she laughed and said, I can't answer that one either. <laughs> that was going to be my next question. <laughs> I'll answer them. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so is there any lessons, life lessons that you can think of that, that kind of really – that took yeah. you really long time to figure out until you're like, yes, oh, I got I'm it. still learning. Peter will back me up in this, but if he has any class, he won't say anything. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the thing okay. that, <laughs> apparently, no class. <laughs> it's easy. It's easy to keep learning when you have so much to learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You ruined it. Okay. And, and he, he never takes notes when I talk to him, which is right. Crazy. It's really hard to study for a test when you don't know what the answers are going to be. <laughs> okay. That's my entire college and grad school career. Um, I got. I knew people who got me the answers. Um, but no, I think it is the same lesson. I think that the lesson in writing that you never stop learning is the same lesson in life is you have to constantly teach yourself to listen. It's hard. It doesn't come naturally to anybody. Most people love to talk Mm -hmm. and listening is hard. And if you're going to be a writer, you have to listen and observe. And that's true of any kind of writing, any kind of acting, any kind of stand up. Mm -hmm. There's a great phrase. The opposite of talking isn't listening. It's waiting. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I, I tell you, I'll tell you, I'll, just, yeah. I'll, I'll leave you with my answer to that one before, though, is experience is a lousy teacher. It gives the exams before the lessons. Yeah, that's great. There's a regular walking Bartlett's home quotation. It you is. Should- <laughs> <laughs> All right. So name, if you can, uh, both of you guys, uh, one of your favorite um, sitcoms and one of your favorite uh, comedy movies or movies in general. Well, I I can't give you my favorite sitcom, but I can give you my favorite current sitcom. Fair enough. Uh, I'm a I'm a. <laughs> it sounds like I echo alien when I say I'm a big Big Bang Theory fan. Mm-hmm. Um, but there have been so many great sitcoms. You know, again, Cheers, Frasier, Taxi, Seinfeld. They're just they're too many, mm-hmm. and they go all the way back to I Love Lucy, and mm-hmm. just it it'll be easier to tell you the ones I haven't liked. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> and okay. it, but there have been so many great movie comedies. You just, you, where do you start? One that comes into your mind. Where do you start? I can tell you Jeffrey's favorite uh, comedy was Porky's. Yeah, right. <laughs> I actually never saw Porky's, believe it or not. He's lived it. <laughs> How about you, Jeffrey? Any answers on this? Uh, well, uh, I, I guess my favorite classic comedy would have to be Mary Tyler Moore show. I just love that show. I can watch it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, I think... One of the more recent, it's off the air now three years, but I just thought it was um, much better than Friends, and I'm sure it owes something to Friends, and is doing very well in syndication and on Netflix now, around nine seasons, and uh, was written by two theater guys, and then they went on to work for David Letterman before they created How I Met Your Mother. I just think it's a brilliant show. I think it's so beautifully written. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And imaginative and risky for a network show, just the way they did it, going in and out of satire, mm -hmm. and points of view. And then I guess uh, uh, Chuck Lorre's show, the only one that I watch, I'm not saying because Peter loves The Big Bang and I, I, I like it too. Um, it's, it's just not my kind of humor, but I like it. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. But I love Mom, which and I oh. love Grace and Frankie. I think Grace and Frankie is amazing. It is. Uh, there's also, there's, they're going backward to the shows that I unfortunately wrote in the early 90s. Uh, there's a show called The Ranch on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a new one with Kathy Bates. Yes, that's another uh, one. And, and I don't find either of them remotely funny. They're like, it's the old three jokes a page thing they're going back to. Uh, her premise is a woman who owns, a, opens up, what? Six jokes. <laughs> six jokes, three jokes. <laughs> Keep thinking it's six, but I don't, I don't remember that rule. I only remember three. Okay. I showed recordings of old talks when you said that. Oh, I lied. <laughs> you guys could discuss it afterward, Todd. <laughs> oh, no, during. During, of course. We're a lot more entertaining when we're arguing, I think. Okay. But yeah, I've, I've heard both those shows are not doing very well, uh, and that's a probably a good reason why. And, and, and yet, One Day at a Time is doing really well mm -hmm. because the ghosts are all from character. Where are the, Where is that show playing? Netflix. Is that Netflix? Second season, yeah. Okay, I gotta look that up. I haven't even—I didn't even hear about it. Anytime I hear Rita Moreno's in anything, I'm there. She's so. wonderful. She's wonderful. Now, where where can where can people find you guys online? Uh, if if you go to um, let's see, now that's funny dot lol, mm -hmm. and you can find us. Okay, fantastic. And then the name of your books? Now that's funny. That <laughs> which is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and all but fine. All but just as a matter of bad taste, I will plug my most recent joke book. Go for it. Which is The Bad Sex Manual. <laughs> I wrote my friend Tom, who wrote and directed Friday the 13th, Part 6. Okay. So you can imagine what it's like. Okay. Um, but before we finish, yeah. um, can I just quickly say you have made this so easy for us. Yeah, oh. you, great. you ask great questions. You, you put up with a lot. You're a really good listener as well. Thank and you so much. I appreciate that. So you've made this enormously fun and easy for us. So we appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Uh, 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 oh, so when you when you turn off the, he wants to tell you what he really thinks once you turn. So, so, so once I turn once I stop the recording, then you can tell me what you really think. Well. Sure. <laughs> I appreciate it. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to, to me and the, and, the, and the Indie Film Hustle tribe. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You've made this really fun. Peter and Jeffrey were an absolute riot, and I hope you guys have a better understanding of what it takes to make people laugh and what it's like to actually write a comedy. I know when I was working on This Is Meg, which is a dramedy, drama comedy, uh, there are a lot of comedic elements in This Is Meg. And, uh, you know, I just sat back and watched some of these amazing actors uh, that were in the cast just come up with this humor. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. We figured it out in the editing room. But it was just such a wonderful thing to be on a set where you're laughing almost all the time. It was just an, a very enjoyable process. And 
I hope you guys can bring some comedy into your into your work. Whether even if it's the if a drama, you know, some sometimes a little joke here or there brings the audience in and just and keeps them going in your story and in your journey. So I hope this was a benefit and a value to you guys. And if you want to link to uh, Peter and Jeffrey's book, Now That's Funny, The Art and Craft of Writing Comedy, just head over to our show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 194. And if you guys haven't already gone to the Indie Film Hustle YouTube channel, you've got to head over there because there is so much stuff going on. I'm adding new content almost daily now. I'm getting a little crazy on it. I'm sorry. But I am adding new videos almost on a daily basis. It is going crazy. I'm so excited about how much growth uh, that channel is getting and uh, that we're getting the word out on Indie Film Hustle and getting more uh, more of this information out to filmmakers who need it. So if you want to check it out, please head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. Now, after I post this, I'm heading over to AFM. So if you guys are in the area, today is November 6th on Monday. So if you're around, hit me up, tweet me, uh, send me an instant message. If I'm around, I'd love to catch a coffee with you guys, meet and greet, talk to you guys, and help you in any way I can. So I hope to see you guys there. And I'm going to have a little bit more uh, stuff coming out from AFM and my adventures at AFM, which have been extremely educational so like everything I do in my career, I learn, I bring it, I, I organize it, and I bring it back and share it with you guys so you guys can learn and grow faster on your filmmaking journey. So as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.